level. Hey, what's going on everyone? Mike from Go Cell Phone Repair with the Monday Afternoon Tech Talk Live. Thanks for all of you who are already have already joined the stream and if you're watching the replay, you can always skip ahead and uh, get to the information part of this video. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Samsung's folding screen technology allegedly stolen and sold for a profit. <laughs> That's kind of messed up. Uh, the radical new iPhone design that's supposed to excite people and encourage them to update because apparently uh, they're not really doing so at the rate that they used to. Uh, Samsung Galaxy S10 leak, guess what? It is going to have, well, I don't know if you want to call it a notch, but there's going to be a hole in the screen. Surprise. Uh, the fate of satellite TV. Yeah, it looks like it is the beginning of the end, at least in the U.S. market. Microsoft has won a $480 million contract with the U.S. Army. We'll talk about what that means. And a synthetic fingerprint tool that can fool touch ID systems. So there's something to uh, get excited about again as well. All right, we'll get it started right after this. And we have no, <laughs> we have no um, stinger there, so that's okay. Let's get this off the screen and we will go back to the beginning where I was a minute ago. What's going on everyone? We got Nate in the house, Ali, Hassan, Carl, Laterno, Johnny Chang, Oscar, what's going on guys? Glad to see you here. And uh, yes, stolen, that is the story. At least that's what they're saying, Nate. And I think that this one is legitimate. As far as I can tell, everything in the article sounds like this is something that actually happened. Uh, stuck in traffic. Well, that sucks. Uh, Ali, doing good. How are you? I hope you're uh, doing well also. I think they mean it somehow folded and slipped away from their folders, Johnny. That's pretty funny. And in fact, I wanted to say, uh, Johnny, you weren't here, I think, on the last stream. 
and I did want to acknowledge that when you had mentioned something, because I always try to go back and if I say something that is not completely accurate, I want to make sure to uh, clarify. You had said that we should unionize in order to, you know, kind of uh, fight against corporations who don't support the right to repair or who are, you know, preventing us from making any headway there. And that was absolutely the right term. There are two different definitions of union, and one of them brings to mind things that people feel very strongly about one way or the other. But when we talk about unionizing, as far as uniting and in, in an effort to do something, that doesn't mean that you're going on strike or that you're unionizing against an employer or a corporation or something like that specifically. So I wanted to clarify, you are absolutely right. I said that that might not be the right term, but in fact it is. So uh, we should definitely do that. So as far as this folding screen thing, oh, and hey, Oscar, I'm gonna shoot you a message a little later. I don't know if I'll be around tomorrow or if you're uh, planning to head out. So if so, let me know, because I don't think I'm gonna be out there tomorrow, at least not until the late afternoon. So uh, let's get down to business here. The Suwon District Prosecutor's Office, apparently in, uh, is this in Hong Kong? This is in South, this is in South Korea. Uh, charged 11 people on Thursday with stealing tech secrets from Samsung. The office said in a statement, the prosecutors allege that one of the suppliers for Samsung displays leaked blueprints of Samsung's flexible OLED edge panel 3D lamination to a company they had set up. Then they sold those secrets to Chinese firms for $14 million. And there's an interesting thing here, if you remember, or you may or not uh, may or may not remember, but the guy who was in charge of, I want to say he was, I don't know if he was the president, but he was pretty high up with HTC. And a few years ago, what they did is pretty much the same thing. They were working inside the company. They took a bunch of information, set up a separate company, or were dealing with another organization, and took a lot of that intellectual property and sold it kind of under the table. And he did end up getting in trouble for that. I'm sure they prosecuted him and so forth. This looks like we're seeing the same thing. And the funny thing about it is, you know, I, what I'm going to talk about here a little later in the stream is that we have seen that growth in smartphone sales has kind of leveled off because for the most part, you know, you reach a level of what they call uh, market saturation or penetration. And that means that everybody who's looking for something has it. And in order to give them an incentive to upgrade every year, which is, you know, as you can imagine, if you're a big company that makes smartphones, if you make a phone that people keep for two or three years, then it's that much longer before you're gonna make any money unless you figure out additional revenue streams. Now, of course, they have like the App Store, they have service that they're putting in, uh, they have things like the Apple Store. But beyond that, at its core, when it comes to the handset market, you've got to continue to increase those numbers every year. And that's difficult to do, especially when you have phones that are coming up, you know, seven, eight, nine hundred dollars a thousand. Allegedly, the new Samsung foldable phone is going to be something more like eighteen hundred dollars. And that's going to be a tough sell, I think, in the beginning. So what, what do they do? They go, well, let's innovate. Let's come up with something exciting that people really want to see. And I think that a lot of us are skeptical as to whether or not the foldable screen technology is going to be a big deal or not. It may or may not. There are lots of companies who are jumping on that bandwagon and saying they're going to do exactly the same thing. That includes Apple. Um, and when, when you look at Samsung and they kind of make fun of Apple for putting a notch in the phone, then we find out Samsung's going to put a notch in their phone and then Apple's always trying to... Uh, you know, stand or, or, or at least Apple enthusiasts will say, well, Apple does so many things better. They would never couple, copy Samsung or anyone else. And they do. They all copy each other at some level. So the fact that this, which is a big deal for Samsung, you know, uh, I, I should say has big marketing potential to be the first major company that has a foldable screen phone and then to have that technology stolen and sold to someone else that will be interesting to see what happens long term, especially if you're dealing in uh, a location like China where probably trademarks and copyrights are are treated differently, at least than the way that we're used to seeing them seen in the US or in Europe and in other parts of the world. It often seems like when that information leaks out, then whoever gets a hold of it makes what they want and there's you know, generally not a lot of repercussions, at least that I'm aware of. I could be completely wrong on that, but I think they don't come down nearly as hard as they do here in the States. So prosecutors from uh, said Samsung invested six years and some 150 
excuse me, 150 billion won, which equates to 130 million dollars to develop the bendable screen. Demand for high-end smartphones begins to wane, and that's kind of what I was saying earlier. It's like you've got to come up with something new. You have to make something that people that's going to get people excited, really. And when we look at what phones do nowadays, it's like, where do you go from here? You know, is a folding screen going to excite you? Um, is not having a headphone jack going to excite you? Do we need more cameras, more lenses? I mean, what's really going to take a customer who dropped a thousand dollars on a flagship phone this year decide that next year, oh, I've just, I have to upgrade. You know, I have to have this new thing out there. Obviously, there are certain. Uh, percentage of the population who are going to do that regardless. They're always going to buy the latest, greatest, greatest, newest, whatever it is, but that is not the majority by far. An interesting thing here, uh, Samsung does continue to be the largest smartphone maker worldwide with a 20% global market share. I want to say that Huawei is second at this point and Apple third, if I remember correctly. Um, investigators have not been able to track down and question two Chinese individuals believed to be involved in the case and have asked Interpol to help find and detain them. And, you know, that's that's one thing. They probably will at some point. But as of now, the cat's out of the bag. You know, someone else has the same technology or the information as far as what Samsung used to create this foldable, bendable phone. So that kind of takes that exclusive design, at least the way that they made it, uh, out of their hands for a certain uh, to an extent. Uh, let's see. Actually, smart the smartphone market is slowing down as Apple are winding down the production of their new iPhone due to overstock. Uh, and in fact, they tried decreasing the prices as well, right? And that really didn't have the result that they were hoping that it would. The Notch affair is akin uh, the fashion of the big mole in the face of socialites. Hey, Caesar, what's going on? Uh, Samsung will shake this off and keep innovating with their displays, which are the best and phones, of course. Uh, yeah, you know what's funny? Um, I'm gonna read you a couple articles here that I that really caught my attention, and you'll see the similarities here briefly, but I do wanna move on because we are 10 minutes in, and I'm gonna get through all of these articles, and then if we have, uh, time permitting, I have another Mike asks you to help solve a problem. And it, again, if we have time at the end of the stream, I'm gonna get to that. Maybe you guys can uh, give me a little advice. All right, so Apple leaks a radical new phone design. Remember this headline, okay, for a reason. Okay, Apple leaks, would you get off my screen? Okay, this is really going to bug me. Why is it stuck on the Apple uh, ticker there? We don't need to see that. Okay, stop, there we go. Okay, so, um, oh, but I lost all of my highlights. Let's try this again. Did they show up? Well, now that's lovely. I guess you can't complain when something's free, but this thing doesn't always work the way that I would like to. Okay. So there is a new radical iPhone feature that everyone's gonna have to have, right? Wanna guess what it is? Uh, they're talking about bringing back Touch ID, shocker. So this may in fact be something that a lot of people will be excited about and, and welcome it back, you know, as uh, we've gone away from Touch ID and moved into Face ID instead. And um, it's difficult for me to be to give you a subjective opinion because I don't use either of those features. I really, personally, I can care less. I've got a pin, you know, I've got a passcode and that's good. I don't like the idea of having to align my finger or my face or anything else with my phone, but obviously there are people who enjoy those features and a lot of them who complained about the fact that Touch ID went away, you know, and didn't like the fact that you have to hold your phone right up in front of your face and look at it to get it to turn on, which makes a lot of sense. You know, if you can just reach across the table and put your fingerprint on it and it opens up, that would be great. Uh, I would go as far as to say that it would be nice if there was maybe some voice ID technology where you could tell your phone to open, you know, to unlock the screen or command Siri to connect to your Bluetooth device because as of 11.0, the connection speed is so much slower and I don't understand why. Like my old phone on 10.3.3, I get in the car, turn it on, I'm connected to Bluetooth immediately. But when I went to 11 on my iPhone 8, it takes probably 45 seconds before it recognizes and I don't understand why that is. But uh, getting back on track here, the difference this time being, of course, that we are talking about bringing back the fingerprint reader, but without the home button, which I'm, again, we're gonna have mixed reactions on this, right? So Apple is currently evaluating biometric sensor suppliers, O-Film, 
General Interface Solution and TPK Holding. These are all companies, I believe, uh, or at least some of them, that work with Samsung, who is also developing its own Touch ID built into the screen, but it's going to work a little differently than a traditional fingerprint scanner. Um, Apple, you know, why? I think the real answer, and this is just my guess here, I think the real reason that Apple would bring back Touch ID is because people want it. You know, it's useful. It has so many benefits over having to pick up your phone and stick it in front of your face. Again, I can't be too subjective because I haven't used it, but just by observing people unlocking their phones with Face ID, it doesn't look... Okay, please don't take this personal, but I am not a fan of AirPods. I don't care for the appearance. That's just my opinion. I'm only one guy and I'm probably completely wrong, but I don't think they look great, if that makes sense. But they... Um, they probably look a little funnier than somebody holding a phone up in front of their face than trying to unlock it, but I suppose that's debatable. Like I said, this is just opinion, so uh, don't hate me because of that. But being able to reach over your phone, put your fingerprint on it, and unlock it, especially if you're in a situation where you maybe shouldn't have your phone or you know you don't want it to be a distraction or make it seem to people like you're, you're not paying attention to them because you're sitting in a meeting and instead you pick up your phone and stick it in front of your face. You know, it makes a lot of sense to have that Touch ID built in. So I suspect this is one of the reasons, if not the main reason, that Apple said, yeah, we probably shouldn't have gotten away from that. People were enjoying it. And uh, not only that, but there is an additional cost built into adding Face ID to a phone. So if you're going to look at something like your tablets and your MacBooks and every future iPhone that comes out, you have to remember that building that Face ID is going to be a cost factor. And if you're trying to keep your price point down, it's going to be difficult to build that in. So, you know, at least according to this article, this was one of the reasons that he gave as to a good explanation as to why Apple might make this move. Um, one, with the iPads, it seems as though they're trying to eliminate the home button. And obviously to do that, if you're going to have a fingerprint scanner, it has to go somewhere, right? Also, uh, as I mentioned, avoiding the cost of adding Face ID into a tablet. So uh, this makes a lot of sense, I think. You know, I, I'm certainly critical of all companies, including Apple, but I think that this makes a lot of sense for them to do something like bringing back Touch ID because it was such a popular feature. Now, if they tie that into the screen and make it impossible to get a repair done, without doing something crazy, that obviously will be uh, a detriment, not only to people in the repair business, but also to consumers. I mean, I guess we'll see how that uh, pans out. Uh, let's see, uh, are future iPhones going to dispense Apple juice? Uh, maybe. Motorola has, has it since first Droid series predecessor of the current X and Z series. Maybe a saliva authentic authentication for DNA. Well, there was somebody that licked their phone, and I was just thinking about how disgusting that was. Because you walk around in public, touching all sorts of doorknobs and tables and shaking hands and everything else, and then you then you grab your phone. So you have to imagine that a lot of what you pick up out in public is on your phone. Your phone. It's not just your germs. It's like germs from everywhere. And then somebody makes a video and licks their phone. Ugh. Uh, sneeze indicate. Oh, sorry. I gotta go. Okay, Oscar. Um, we'll talk to you soon. A sneeze authenticator would be hilarious. Yeah, but you'd have to trigger the sneeze somehow, right? So um, the difference here being that Samsung will be using an ultrasonic tech as Samsung, did I say Samsung? Apple will uh, be looking at, allegedly, ultrasonic technology in order to create the, the uh, Touch ID. And these are said to be as quick and accurate as any physical a reader and even more secure. Now keep this in mind for two reasons. One, because of the title of this article, Apple leaks reveal radical new iPhone design. And then later on, we'll talk about how synthetic fingerprints make biometric fingerprint recognition systems vulnerable. Perfect, right? Okay, so this is what got my attention and I like both of these articles, but it's funny. So this is December 2nd, 2018. Apple leak reveals radical new iPhone design. How about this? December 2nd, 2018, Samsung leak suddenly exposes radical Galaxy S10. Oh, is it the same guy? Yes, it is. So I, I do enjoy these articles. I just thought it was really funny how they have almost the exact same title. They're from the same person on the same day through the same publication, which is Forbes. So uh, I, I know that a lot of uh, tech 
bloggers and writers and uh, authors and contributors are under pressure to pump out these articles. But man, these two titles are almost identical. Isn't that crazy? Uh, in any case, next year we'll be looking at four Galaxy S10 models and they will come with up to six cameras, uh, five, 5G carrier support and the biggest phone display Samsung has ever made. Now, obviously that 5G is going to be a very uh, limited, will be limited in its usability because there's not going to be a lot of 5G available. I'm sure if you're in a med, major metropolitan area or some test market, you'll have access to that. But I want to say that last time I looked, Apple wasn't looking, wasn't planning to build 5G into their phones at least until 2020 or later than that, I think. So uh, I don't I don't know if that's really going to be a selling point or not. Up to six cameras, that is kind of crazy. Every model of the Galaxy S10 will cut a hole in their displays, allegedly, again, as far as we know. So the Galaxy S10 Lite, S10, and S10, 10 plus are all are all whole in super AMOLED screens, but here's the thing. The S10 has dual front cameras, so the design is a little different and a little weird, as you'll see here in just a second. Um, the circular hole cut out and positioned in the top left corner for the front camera. So this is a really weird one. I'm gonna show you, uh, let's skip to this picture here real quick. So if you look at this third image here, this Infinity O, this is going to kind of be an oddball. You know, I like the new Infinity and I think I could probably live with Infinity U or Infinity V. I'm not a huge fan of the notch, but you know, the less intrusive, the better. But to have it over there in the corner like that seems, I don't know, asymmetrical, I guess. Kind of bizarre. Um, probably not the biggest deal ever, but man, I'm really just skeptical about how people are going to react to that. Now, they do make good displays. There's no arguing that. Uh, let's see, the new Infinity display, which will integrate cameras and sensors under the, the display, which is what we're really waiting for, the one, the fourth one here, uh, apparently won't be ready until at least 2020. So that will be, I think, a big deal when that one launches. Again, with the 5G, not sure that this is going to be a huge deal, but it does give you bragging rights. You know, if you're the first major corporation that has the latest, greatest technology, you can always say first. I don't know that that helps people too much, uh, but there it is. Let's see. Uh, Nate does not like Touch ID, prefer Face ID. Fair enough. I don't like how, uh, hey, what's going on, Harvey? I don't like how Tom Cruise can make a face mask and get into anyone's phones. <laughs> uh, wait till we see what's coming. Why they can't take a, sh a snapshot of your fingers instead of your face for unlock purposes. Thumbs up to unlock. That would be an interesting one. You know, that's funny, Johnny. I hadn't thought about that. I would assume that the camera technology is not accurate enough at this point in time. Uh, but this ultrasonic fingerprint ID scanner sounds interesting. You know, they're saying it's just as accurate as having a physical button that reads your fingerprint. So that will be uh, something to see. Whoever creates a two-way optical sensor and display integrated is going to rule the future of gadgets. Well, when we look at the stuff that's coming up, um, you can't rule out anything. The, the technology is just moving at a speed where uh, it's mind-boggling. And it's funny because every time I talk to people about, hey, what about you know the day when this happens and the day when this happens? And I remember having this conversation and talking about artificial intelligence and you'll get a lot of people who react with skepticism, you know, oh, they'll never make a machine that's the same as a person. It's not going to happen. It's just, it, it, to in our minds, it's so far away or it's so far-fetched that we think, yeah, that, that you just can never fool a human. You know, you can never make a machine that acts like a person. And while we probably haven't reached that point yet, a lot of things have changed in the last, you know, 20, not to mention 10 years. And in fact, I remember hearing a quote from Bill Gates, who I think, I think this took place in the 90s, it might have been the 80s, but where he said that we have a 486 processor built into a computer and nobody is ever going to need any more than that. And there's no reason to really go beyond this type of tech. And you can imagine when they shut down the, the US patent office, I want to say it was back in the late 1800s because the person in charge said that, you know what, everything that can be invented has been. That's it. There's nowhere to go from here. There's nothing new. 
we're going to close the patent office because there's no, nothing, no new ideas coming up that anyone can ever innovate and make things more modern or different or more advanced than they are today. And, you know, yet here we are. So, um, yeah, who knows, man? Uh, we may have some Tom Cruise. We might have some Minority Report stuff going on one of these days. Uh, didn't someone already do that? Got a high-res photo of someone's prints and make a fingerprint that unlocked the phone, uh, the device. Yeah, they did, Nate. In fact, they did this back on the iPhone 5S, I believe. Right after the 5S came out, they were able to duplicate a fingerprint and spoof the Touch ID. And since then, that's kind of they've kind of been, uh, you know, doing crazy things like that. Now, I want to say as of the 6 or the 6S, they built something in that would detect. Uh, I don't know if it was based on body temperature or blood circulation, but there was some other factor that they introduced to authenticate and make sure that it was a real live finger that was sitting on the fingerprint scanner. But obviously there, you know, eventually, if not already, there will be ways to get around that. That fake news, Mike, about the patent office, it was a spoof article that people quote as real, still fake news. Really? Okay. I'll take your word for it, Nate, because you are more informed about this stuff than I am. But I, okay. See, look at that. I fell for the fake news because I read this somewhere and it's been so long that it never occurred to me to go back and fact check it. So uh, let's do that right now. And I believe you, but I want to see the proof. Um, so let's try this just for fun since we're here and we're live. U.S. patent. I can't spell. Okay. U.S. patent. Off, uh, up, uh, <laughs> this closed 1830, right? So you're saying, did you check this out on Snopes? Uh, tracing the quote, everything that can be invented has been invented. I'm interested to see what exactly happened here. Uh, he was the, Charles Duell was the commissioner of the U.S. Patent Office in, 18, in 1899. His most famous attributed utterance is that everything that can be invented has been invented. Do I have the right link here? However, with a bit more searching, I came across an edition of Punch magazine that had been donated to Harvard, blah, 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 uh, in, col in colloquy? colloquy, a genius asked, isn't there a clerk who can examine patents? A boy replied, quite unnecessary, sir, everything that can be invented has been invented. Well, there you go. So, uh, okay, it was just an example, but obviously this was not accurate. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. So that never happened, apparently. All right, I can check that off another list of uh, misinformation that we have here. Charles Holland Well. So I'm sure it's here on Wikipedia. Oh, here we go. Uh, let's see. In fact, Duell said in 1902, in my opinion, all previous advances in the various lines of invention will appear totally insignificant. I almost wish I might live my life over again to see the wonders which are at the threshold. In that edition, a comedy magazine offered a look at the coming century and, okay, and then the quote, um, a boy replied, quite unnecessary. Okay, cool. So that never happened. But you get the idea. There have been many statements made uh, throughout history where people said, you know, things can't get any more advanced than they are. And that certainly has not impeded progress in any way. You know, just by saying that we can't do things any better than we've done so far doesn't mean the system's shutting down and nobody's going to continue trying, which is why I believe that uh, a lot of things are possible. I shouldn't say anything, but a lot of things. We should do a fake news live stream for sure. Has anyone, uh, have anyone catch wind about the latest face transplant performed at the NYU Langone Hospital? Does a person that got a new face ID will have any difficulty re-enable their face ID? Oh, you're funny, Johnny. Uh, I would imagine they'd have to reconfigure or add a face or delete the old face or however it is that that works. But yeah, that might be an issue for them. Uh, although, remember, there were some people who were passing for their uh, neighbors and relatives and stuff initially when the face ID came out. So who knows? Uh, anyways, let's move on here. It is the beginning of the end for satellite TV in the U.S., according to QZ.com. And I, I don't have a hard time believing this one, but uh, let's keep it, let's keep it uh, as real as we can. Allegedly, this quote came from John Donovan, the CEO of AT&T Communications, and he said, We've launched our last satellite. The executive declared the end of the satellite TV area with that statement. AT&T owns DirecTV, if you didn't already know that. The, US largest, the U.S.'s largest satellite company um, and second largest TV provider behind Comcast. The problem is you can't stream over satellite the same way that you do 
over a broadband connection. And we've all seen this coming for a long time. You know, satellites are uh, susceptible to problems with the weather, being repositioned, and uh, all sorts of other things. But the main thing is that broadband has given people so many options that it's difficult to compete with them. And it would make a lot of sense, I would think, for AT&T to be on the side of net neutrality so that they can say, hey, maybe we can get in on some of this infrastructure that was built in, built by other companies and be able to compete. But I'm sure they, they had their own interests to protect when they uh, took the opposing side there. So, you know, this is, a, this is a very funny thing to me because a few years ago, what, when did they come out with satellite radio? I want to say that that was in the late 90s, if I remember correctly. Remember what a big deal that was? Everyone was going to satellite radio. You could listen to a station anywhere. It didn't matter. And they were basically competing with all the local stations. I'm sure that anyone who owned a radio station wasn't happy about that. And, you know, since then we've realized that uh, satellite radio is not going to work the same way because we can stream media now. So if you can turn on your smartphone and whether you're in a tunnel or not, you're generally going to be getting a signal. Whereas if you have a satellite radio receiver, if you are under some trees or, you know, you're obscured from view of the satellite, you're going to have problems. It's my understanding that satellite radio does not work in Hawaii because of the uh, position that they're in, uh, in relation to the satellite. So they're, you know, over time we've revealed that with new technology, we just have better options. You know, there are a lot of things that work better than trying to connect to a satellite to get a signal. And obviously these satellites cost a lot of money to launch and I would assume to maintain. And on top of that, if you're losing subscribers at the same time, it's going to be difficult to maintain, um, you know, a business model that's based on that technology. So right now, uh, as of September, DirecTV has 20 million satellite video subscribers they will continue to offer their tv service i assume until these things fall out of orbit or or uh, they lose enough subscribers that it doesn't make sense to continue broadcasting um they have a new set top box obviously let's see what else here they expect to be to uh become oh i know what it was so what they also determined was that a lot of their services can be streamed and i think it's uh later here in the article so a lot of what AT&T is selling can come through your broadband connection. Uh, let's see. Satellite TV first took hold in the U.S. In the, la in the last, how about in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Consumers have shifted to new digital TV offerings like Netflix and Hulu or the live PlayStation View service. That You know what's funny is I don't know the first thing about PlayStation View service. I don't know if that is a popular one. I assume that maybe it is. That's weird. Uh, satellite radio cannot work out of line of sight. LTE and 5G technologies has better coverage. Uh, Harvey said, I, I prefer blurry analog TV than a frozen pixelated image. You know, yeah, I was a fan of satellite TV for a while. I'm going to say, again, back in the late 90s, the image quality, at least where I was located, you your satellite image quality was way better than anything cable had. This was before everyone went to fiber and there was no HD or anything like that. And the, the satellite image quality was just amazing. I remember getting a Sony Trinitron TV, setting it up and looking at it and thinking, this is terrible. This should look way better than it does. And I put a DVD on and it looks great. I go to a friend's house and he happened to be in the satellite business. And I'm looking at his TV thinking, wow, this thing that's five years older than my TV looks way better. How are you doing this? He goes, oh man, you have to get satellite. It's so much better. Like the image quality is in HD. You've got all these channels. And, and I went out and uh, called him up and got satellite. And ever since then, oh, you know, it's a funny thing though. When I went to move, they had, and I don't want to mention the name of the company, but they had this uh, satellite movers thing. So if you relocated to a new address, you could take your satellite dish with you and it wouldn't cost you anything. At least that's how it was advertised. And then I found out that when I moved, that if you move to a different state, then there was a cost incurred with installing the dish. And I said, you know what? Okay. Um, you now have competition. So now we have stuff just as good as satellite TV. What are you going to do to keep me online? And they said, well, good luck. So uh, that's when I ended up switching. And it seems to be a, a an ongoing theme with a lot of companies. You know, it's like if you're... If your attitude towards your customer is if you don't like it, there's the door. I think a lot of people are going to walk. 
in addition to when you say, well, we have the best thing there is, so, you know, you'll be back. Well, you're just guaranteeing that I'm never going to come back to you, I mean, out of spite, if nothing else. I don't know how they how they get so, uh, so big-headed about this stuff, but, uh, well, you'll lose one vote on that one. So, yeah, this is going to be interesting. We, what happens to all these satellites up there, first of all? They, I would assume that they just, you know, they last for so long, right? And then doesn't anything in orbit eventually, doesn't it kind of degrade its, um, what would you call that? So they're in orbit, but I think over time they eventually get pulled closer to the Earth, you know, and it probably takes decades for this to happen, but we always hear about these satellites that are up there eventually falling through the atmosphere and they're supposed to burn up on their way in and then they don't always and you find chunks of them here and there. So I wonder if the same thing's going to happen with this. I guess we'll see, but um, I would imagine that a lot of people who are in rural areas that don't have access to broadband, don't have access to cable and fiber and stuff like that, they really rely on having a satellite signal and their options must be so limited because you you know, you know can watch whatever's being broadcasted at the time that it's being broadcasted. But I do know that without a telephone connection, you know, some other connection, whether it's an internet connection through uh, a different means or a dial-up connection, you can't order pay-per-views more than like once or twice because they have to reset something inside the box to make sure that you're paying for the ones that you ordered. I remember running into this because I did away with my home phone a long time ago and I had a dish receiver and I ordered a couple pay-per-views and I went to get the third one. It said I had to connect to their 800 number in order to verify whatever it was that I would order so that they could bill me for it because obviously there's only a one-way communication if you're receiving a signal. So you've got to let that box communicate with the satellite company and say, oh, he ordered these services, bill him for these, and then they would reset it and allow you to order something else. So if you're in the middle of nowhere and you have no telephone, I wonder how you go about that, number one. Secondly, I know that you can get internet satellite service, but I don't know what the speeds will be like. And I, I, I would imagine they're nothing like broadband, at least when it comes to your upstream. So anyways, um, we'll follow that one and see what happens. Okay, so Microsoft has won a $480 million contract to supply the U.S. Army with 100,000 HoloLens headsets. Okay. Get ready for Universal Soldier because um, things are going getting interesting. I mean, they already are. If you look, if you watch video games and the way that they're being played, and you look at the the weapons that we have available and the technology that the military uses, at least that we're aware of, and I'm sure there's a lot of stuff out there that's kind of top secret, and we don't actually see it until there's some sort of major offensive, and then you know we find out that they have a missile that can fly. You know, what was it like? hundreds of miles and, and basically focus on something the size of a nickel and fly through a window and hit it. Uh, bunker buster bombs. You know, we don't find out about a lot of that stuff until it actually goes into use. So I would imagine um, there's some crazy stuff out there already. But Microsoft, who has been in the news recently, lately, one, for surpassing Apple as being the most valuable company in the world. And number two, also for make, uh, stating that they will make available all of their technology to the United States government. Um, has now won a $480 million contract to provide the U.S. Army with 100,000 HoloLens headsets. Uh, let's see, the goal is to manufacture a single platform that soldiers can use to fight, rehearse, and train. This platform will provide increased lethality, mobility, and situational awareness, uh, all at the same time where we're developing drones that pretty much fight a lot of the battle, I would think. But I, I suppose there will always be a place for... Uh, you know, boots on the ground warfare uh, in some capacity. And certainly the the more technology that you have and the better weapons you have, the better you're going to fare in that situation, right? So this will, uh, th this contract will create a dramatic increase in HoloLens protection. And potentially I would venture to say that we will probably see some of the benefits of this technology because we have the funding you know, this is my question. Are they going to have, let's just pick an arbitrary number here. Let's say this HoloLens visor thing costs $500. Are they going to start selling it to the military for $5,000? Because we know how these contracts go. A lot of times you have a screw that should cost 12 cents and they end up finding the price tag on it is like $12. So I, I certainly hope that that's not what we're going to see long term here because a lot of companies have, 
uh, it seems figured out a way to take advantage of government funded programs and just mark things up to ridiculous margins. So I hope that's not what we're going to be paying for because obviously this is coming from tax money. Uh, and if you're, if you're an American-based company and one of your goals is to assist the U.S. military, which it certainly should be, um, then you shouldn't be taking advantage of them in that capacity, I wouldn't think. Microsoft is running for a $10 billion Pentagon cloud contract as well. I can't imagine what, what type of cloud storage and and functionality do you get for ten billion dollars that seems like a lot of money a lot of money um, Microsoft are making a living out of their patent royalties rather than innovating at software as they used to be hmm uh, Harvey said rural satellite satellite internet is slightly faster than dial-up Ugh. It's faster to send paper mail than to send email I felt that way many times when somebody asks me to fax them something I just, I say, look, should I just put it in the mail instead? Come on, people. We have email. You, I can scan a document and even, no, it has to be faxed. There's a lot of weird stuff that just, very frustrating to me. You know, when you're dealing with something like that, where there is a legal obligation for a certain type of document that hasn't kept up with technology, like you really want me to fax you something? Come on. Satellites are not what we think. Here is a video of one that crashed recently. It's attached to a balloon. Oh, interesting. Uh, I will check that out, Nate. So we'll have to see where this goes, but uh, obviously they've won the contract, so I can only imagine like what what type of heads-up display you're going to have as a soldier. You know, ultimately when they start um, when they start issuing these things, which they probably have at some level. But that will be a trippy thing. Now, the other thing is having large corporations and government doing business together is always an, in, it comes with interesting implications, I think. Uh, at least it's Microsoft and they're not doing business with some company from outside the US. Uh, I will check it out, Nate. Thank you for that link. Okay, so as we were as we were talking about earlier with the fingerprint scanning stuff this I thought was very interesting this is from latest hacking news uh, <laughs> gotta love that uh, that little symbol they have up there okay so scientists allegedly scientists have figured out ways to ditch fingerprint recognition and biometric systems via synthetic fingerprints so a team of researchers according to this article a team of researchers from the New York University Tandon School of Engineering is using neural networks synthesizing human fingerprints artificially has now... Sorry, I, I cut out a sentence and that didn't come out right, so let's try that again. A team of researchers from the New York University Tandon School of Engineering is who we're talking about, and they have, using neural networks, synthesizing... Oh, through using neural networks, synthesizing human fingerprints artificially has now become possible. The researchers even succeeded in developing a fake fingerprint that could potentially spoof any fingerprint recognition system. How did they do this? Well, I will get to this more in the article, but the basic idea behind this is that a lot of fingerprint scanners only look at a certain number of points when they're trying to identify your fingerprint. And because of this, using this neural network they have figured out exactly a certain number of points that are being processed. And it, it, the way that I understand this is that they say, is this here, is this here, is this here, is this here? And if any of that's missing, then it doesn't add up. Well, what they have done is develop a fingerprint that is something similar to a master key. So it will basically not be a perfect match of any one single fingerprint, but it will share many of these common um, data points that all sorts of people's fingerprints have. So when you put this thing on top of a fingerprint scanner, it might match mine, yours, and thousands of other people. And it's kind of a, a like we call them skeleton keys, but it's just a key that fits every lock. So let's read here in the article. It says, Master prints are a set of real or synthetic fingerprints that can fortuitously match with a large number of other fingerprints. Therefore, they can be used by an adversary to launch a dictionary attack against a specific subject that can compromise the security of a fingerprint-based recognition system. 
So we might want to think twice about that one before we worry about who's building fingerprint uh, scanning technology into their screens. If you're worried about it, you know, I mean, obviously the, it, it, it's going to be a very small number of people who are really, really concerned about the trade secrets and uh, proprietary information and things that they have that someone would go out of their way to steal your phone and want to be able to hack into it and, and find that stuff. Uh, I would think that that would be limited to high profile people like uh, politicians, maybe, um, I don't know, really, you know, who, who's going to do that? Do you just, does somebody just invest in this and say, okay, I'm just going to start stealing phones and unlocking them? I don't know. Uh, latent variable evolution technology is what they're talking about here. The proposed method referred to as LVE is based on training a generative adversarial network on a set of real fingerprint images, stochastic search in the form of covariance matrix adaptation evolution strategy is then used to search for latent input variables to the generator network that can maximize the number of imposter matches of imposter matches almost got through that one as assessed by a fingerprint recognizer wow so security risk to biometric system dictionary attacks such attacks do not require a potential attacker to know an individual's real fingerprints Obviously, right? We, we understand that part. The previous study dealing with master prints could only create partial fingerprints. The technology demonstrated herewith allows creating images of complete fingerprints. So as far as, uh, and this is another reason why I think I'm a little skeptical about biometric authentication. And that is, as with most technology that we see, the more complex it becomes, the more ways that people find to attack it. You know, if you have a, um, a physical lock and a pair of bolt cutters, you can get through that, right? And there, there are many ways to do that. You could, use, um, you could use liquid nitrogen to shatter it. You can use some sort of uh, pry tool to pry the lock off. But there are a certain number of ways that you can break into a physical lock and then there's, it's kind of like we know about those already. But when we start introducing new technologies like biometric authentication, we don't always know like how many different ways there are to attack this thing. And the fact that currently at least, the way that they function is to only check for these different, uh, these different factors that, that these guys have obviously figured out a way to spoof is a bit concerning, I think, for some people who are using fingerprint authentication. Now again, if this is something that costs a lot of money or is difficult to attain, then probably most people don't have to worry about it. But it's one of those things where if it works and it becomes popular and people want to pay for it and it starts to proliferate, then if every criminal on the block, which we can assume that a lot of crime has moved into the technology sector, you know, because there are so many more ways for people to, uh, I don't know, rob a bank, you know, Rather than walking into a lobby with a gun, now you go online and they start figuring out figuring out ways to access accounts and uh, hack into systems and you know all sorts of other stuff, uh, ID fraud. You have to wonder, like, if eventually a lot of criminal criminal enterprise, at least you know organized criminals, are going to say, okay, let's set up a system where everybody has this tech this technology and now you can start breaking into phones and ATMs and you know whoever whoever or wherever else they're going to be using this sort of thing including people's houses you know there are locks that actually read your fingerprint so what happens if it becomes easy to get a hold of a device that allows you to use this same type of uh, fingerprint spoofing you I, I keep calling it that let's see what do they call it technically uh, there's, I think there's a better term for that. So synthesizing human fingerprints. So if everyone figures out that they can buy a device that allows you to synthesize a human fingerprint and break into, you know, uh, two out of 10 locks, that, that's something that someone with a criminal mind, I would think, is going to be interested in. And if you have this sort of uh, biometric authentication securing something that's important to you, like your house or your phone or your bank account or anything else like that, um, it might be a good idea to have maybe two different ways to authenticate in addition to that. Let's see, where do we go? Uh, just make it simple and get microchipped along with our pets. <laughs> you know, 
Harvey, that I think is probably another good topic for a conspiracy theory live stream, which we need to do soon. And Google Project Loom. Okay, so let's see how much time we have a little time. So I'm going to try to get through this last one and then I'm going to ask you all a question and see if you have any input for me. Figure out this phone has been uh, very frustrating. Oh, actually, that was it. We got through it all. Okay, so Charles Holland Dwell. And where was the other thing that I had open a minute ago? No, nope, that wasn't it. Oh, I closed the wrong tab. Is that what happened? I'm looking for, eh, that's not it either. Hey, by the way, guys, uh, I thought I'll throw this out here since it happened to pop up. I recently got one of these. If you've all, you've probably already seen the Cassie battery activation uh, things that they have for iPhones. The one that I had went all the way up to the iPhone 6, I think it was. Well, I found myself in a situation recently where I wanted to charge a Galaxy battery outside of the phone. And there is a newer model here. It's the Cassie K9208 battery activation board. And this thing, let's see if we can get the image up here on the screen. Come on, can we make this bigger? For some reason, this thing doesn't want to, uh, doesn't want to open. Ah, well, that's frustrating. In any case, this thing supports the iPhone X7, 8, all the way down to the 4 and Samsung Android phone. So you probably already noticed most Galaxy S batteries starting with the with the S6 all the way up to the S8, they have the same type of connector and the polarity is exactly the same. So the, the main difference is the size and the capacity of the battery. So this thing has something built into the board, which is really hard to see because for some reason this image isn't uh, expanding the way that it's supposed to. I probably have my ad blocker turned on. I bet that's why. But you can plug a dead Samsung Galaxy battery into this thing to charge it up, as well as the iPhone 10, everything all the way back to the iPhone 4. The only thing that you need to remember is that these do not generally, at least the original one does not have any sort of overcharge protection. So you don't wanna just leave this charged in, uh, plugged in and charge it all the way up. I would charge it enough to get a surface charge if you need to um, test the battery or install it in a phone, or maybe you have a completely dead battery that just won't take a charge. And instead of zapping it with the power supply, you can achieve the same uh, thing using this, but don't just leave it plugged in for too long because these things don't have a way of knowing when the battery is full. Again, at least with the prior model, I would kind of assume that this was the same. So uh, I would be careful with that. Now, my question for you, Nate, I hope that you're not with the customer and everyone else who might have some input on this. I am looking at something that is uh, challenging. I, if you guys haven't seen, I've been working on this long screw damage phone and it is, I am so close. I am so close. I got everything. The image came back. Uh, originally I was having trouble with the headphone jack and I got that to work. I got the front and rear facing camera. Uh, the strobe is good. I've got a flash on the back, but no earphone sound. And I tested the earphone, I tested the front facing camera flex cable and it wouldn't really make sense. I mean, it's possible that those could have been factors so I wanted to rule them out. But I already knew that this phone had a problem because of long screw damage, okay? So this is what I'm looking at. This is the threaded barrel right below the uh, LCD connector here, or right outside of it here. And I repaired this line. Let's see, can we highlight these? Oh, it doesn't let me highlight, come on. In any case, you can see my mouse, right? Okay, so I repaired this line, this line, and this line. And the other ones I wanna say were intact. In any case, all of these are working fine. Now, for some reason, this right here, which is where the earphone gets some sort of signal to uh, process sound from the audio chip, for some reason, the resistance on this should be around uh, 0.40, right? 0.400, but it is OL, and I cannot for the life of me figure out why. The only way that this thing has to get to ground is through this little diode right here, which um, I'm hoping somebody knows more about than I do, because here's the thing. This filter's good. It does connect to the correct pad on the opposite side of the board. Yes, I completely pulled off the audio chip thinking that there was some sort of failure there and there is not. So I've confirmed that this is connecting underneath the audio IC on the opposite side of the board. Again, keeping in mind that the main problem with this phone, let me get bring my chat back up here on the screen so I can see if anybody actually, uh, here we go, let's move this over here. Come on, 
working with two screens is always fun. Okay, so I know, I, I would have no reason to think that there's any failure in the audio IC chip. Every other feature is working fine. I have confirmed that this filter is connecting to the other side of the board where it's supposed to. I've confirmed that this filter is good. I have replaced this diode three times. By the way, this is a Zener diode. And what kills me is, as you know, a diode has one side that goes to ground. So when you buy these things in a package, there are no markings on the component itself. I mean, it's too small really to, to have anything on it to tell, I'm gonna, gosh darn it, I wish they wouldn't put that thing right there. There we go. Okay, so there's nothing in the package when you buy these new, I would imagine, maybe there is. So what I did is I pulled these off of a donor phone, carefully noting which side was on ground. I assume that that has to make a difference, right? Because a diode by nature is directional. It's either going to be forward biased or reverse biased. And whichever way it is, you want it to go on the board in the same direction. So I did that. I took these off of a donor phone. I replaced it with the same exact diode three times. And this line still says OL. And the only place that I can think of that it gets to ground is right here or somewhere else where it's processed underneath the audio IC chip. And this thing, I, I'm so close to having this finished. I mean, all this stuff over here, done. I've repaired, I've done the hard work. Like all this stuff is working now. And the audio chip I have confirmed has the connection. So what is going on with this? And secondly, secondly, um, I uh, Nate, I tested the speaker manually. So I know that there's sound on the speaker. Um, I've ordered another one just in case, you know, if by some wild, um, but here's the thing. I can tell that there's a fault on the line because this thing, this line right here should have like point, I think it's 0 0.390 or 0 0.400 resistance and it has OL. So whether I measure it with um, diode mode or resistance, either way, it's saying open line. This thing right here, I cannot for the life of me figure out because you take these diodes out of circuit and try to measure them and they all say OL, like every one I've taken off. Is it possible that every diode in, within a phone has failed to the point where you can't read it? So that, in addition, doesn't make sense to me because typically you can measure a diode two different directions. One way is gonna be OL or very, you know, up above one point something. And the other way, will be, the other side should be uh, closer to specification. But these things, I can't get any reading off of them. And I don't know if it's because they're so small. Maybe they're very sensitive to temperature and when you desolder them, they go bad. But that wouldn't make sense because we put so much heat on these boards in the first place. You think you'd be killing them left and right. So I can't figure this thing out. Um, I've tr I'm gonna get another, I'll try another speaker. But again, I know that there's a fault on this line and that's the part that's killing me. And I don't know what it is. And like I said, if I, if I solve this, I'm done. That's it. There's all it is left on this phone to fix. And I'd really love to get it back to the owner and say, here you go. You know, congratulations. We have a working phone. And I can't, I don't know what it is, man. It's killing me. And the crazy thing is if you look at the layers on this thing, um, there are lines that are up above other lines. So long story short, if you, there's actually a, an internal trace underneath this that runs over this direction but you could not dig through the board to get to it because it's covered up on the first layer by another line that obviously if you cut through that, then you're breaking that line. So I don't know. Uh, do you have continuity pin um, from pin to diode to filter? So I have continuity from this end of the filter, the far end of the filter, all the way up to the pin. Okay, so this, all three of these, all three of these red dots, I have continuity to all of those and to the far end of the filter and to the opposite side of the board underneath the audio IC, this goes to ground as it should. But if this goes to ground, I can't, and I don't think it's the only part of the circuit that does. I think it gets processed under the, um, I think that it gets processed under the audio uh, IC and somewhere else it gets to ground, but still, I should be able to measure that resistance here or here, unless I'm just missing something very simple. It, it, it's not adding up. I can't for the life of me figure this one out. Um, hopefully I'll have it worked out before Thursday and I can say, here's what it was. And if you guys find yourself in a similar situation, here's a solution. But as of right now, I'm stuck. And this is very frustrating because everything else is perfect. Uh, see if we highlight here and then we flip it over. Can we flip it? Oh, we don't have to flip it over. We're on easy draw. So if we go up here, you can see this connects to 
L7, and there's no problem there. And then K7 is going to connect to, K7 actually connects to a different filter. And these, uh, by the way, if, you're, if anyone's interested, all four of these pins, one, two, three, four, on the LCD connector, these all have to do with um, the earphone functionality. That's where all four of these, well, it's what they're all involved in, right? So two of them, and I believe it's the outside ones, actually provide the circuit for sound. And these, or they connect to the circuit where the sound ends up going to the earpiece. And these two right here, I believe, process um, data from the audio codec. But I couldn't tell you how, because I am not an electronics engineer. Uh, but this thing right here, this is going to be, this is what I'm going to be stuck on for a while. So if anyone thinks of anything later on, feel free to put a comment and I'll give you full credit. And uh, Harvey, I want to say thanks again for the, the device that you sent. I am still learning how to use that thing, but I have been able to play quite a few games and uh, wasted plenty of time with that. It is really cool. I'll be doing that review uh, in the near future as soon as I can. And I think that's it, folks. So thank you all so much for joining me here. I am going to get back to work. Oh, that's neat. Now we have double chat. Let's uh, minimize that. Uh, I'll get back to work, and I will plan, let's see if we can pull this up here, to talk to you again on Thursday, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If not, we'll be back next week at the same time, 2 p.m. Again, Pacific Standard Time. Talk to you later.